Well, I am sure that each one of you can recall a time in your life when you felt unnoticed, unappreciated, and taken for granted. Of course, none of you feel that way now because we've been studying Philippians 2, and you're not even thinking of yourself, right? But uh, we often feel that way. I know growing up, and in um, or my, so my kids were growing up, and there were many days, you know, I thought, man, all the work I do, and I get no appreciation until sometimes I'd go out of town or play in all-night tournament softball, and my husband would say, man, you do a lot of work. How do you get all this stuff done? But uh, we all have those times in our life where we feel like a nobody. I'm a hidden hero. Nobody knows what I do behind the scenes. Did you know it's possible that the following saints might have felt the same way? Biblical saints like Shanina, Shemaiah, Junius, Ampliatus, Urbanus, Stachus, Apelles, Adronicus, Aristobulus, and Phlegon. Now, you're saying, who are those guys? I would venture to say, if I ask each one of you this morning, do you know one thing about any of those men I just read? You would probably, yeah, one lady's already saying, she's shaking her head, no. Who are they? These people are really in the Bible? Yes. But did you know they are mentioned in the Word of God, all those men I just read, they're mentioned in the Word of God along with the saints mentioned that most of us are familiar with, these saints. Abraham, Moses, Noah, David, Jeremiah, Daniel, Solomon, John the Baptist, and Paul the Apostle. And I bet each of you could name at least one fact about all those men, David, Jeremiah, Paul, uh, Timothy, you could name something about them. Now, does that mean the men that I mentioned in the first grouping are less important than the men I mentioned in the second grouping? No, they're not. Just because they're hidden saints or hidden heroes, they're just as important as the, as the Pauls and the Davids and the Daniels in Scripture. You might say, well, Susan, what is the point you're trying to make? Well, the point I'm trying to make is this. In our last lesson, we looked at the qualities of Paul and Timothy, right, and their friendship. And I imagine before that lesson, every one of you in this room could have given me at least one fact about Timothy. But if I were to start the lesson this morning and say, can you all give me at least one fact about Epaphroditus, you'd probably say, no, unless you've studied Philippians before or memorized it or done some research on it. But does the fact that Epaphroditus is only mentioned twice in all of Scripture, which is right here, by the way, the text we're going to look at this morning, because his name is only mentioned twice in Scripture, does it mean that he's less of a saint than Timothy? No. No. Do you know his relationship with Paul was as important as Paul's relationship with Timothy? So let's find out who just this, who this hidden saint is. Let's read Philippians 2, 25 through 30, and we're going to finish chapter 2, as I mentioned this morning. Notice what he writes. Yet I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he's the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all and he was distressed because you heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, all, him but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow." Therefore I send him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me." Now, in our last lesson, we looked at the six qualities of a biblical friend uh, with Paul and Timothy, and they all started with the letter S. One who, a true friend is one who has a servant's heart, a soulmate, selfless, sincere, the spirit of a son with a father, and one who serves or shares in the gospel. And we also saw that Paul hoped to soon send Timothy to them. Indeed, uh, we learned that not only did Timothy go back to see the church at Philippi, but also the apostle Paul was released from Roman imprisonment, and he did get to go back one more time, at least that we know of, and see the church at Philippi. 
Now, as we look at Paul and Epaphroditus in our final lesson in chapter 2, we're going to look at three things. First of all, the qualities of Epaphroditus. The qualities of Epaphroditus in verses 25 and 26. And then we're going to look at the quick healing of Epaphroditus. The quick healing in verse 27. And then lastly, the quest of the Philippian believers towards Epaphroditus. The quest of the Philippian believers towards Epaphroditus in verses 27. 28 through 30. So let's take a, a closer look at Epaphroditus and the qualities that marked him. Paul says, yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Now, what do we know about Epaphroditus? Well, we know one thing at least, what his name means. Interesting name for those of you that are looking for a name for your baby, because the names today are pretty weird anyway, so Epaphroditus is, uh, but his name is great. It means charming lovely, and a sense of being devoted to. So uh, I'm sure he was charming and he was lovely, and evidently he was very devoted. Um, it's uncertain whether Epaphroditus was still with Paul at Rome at the time that he wrote this. We don't know if he was still there or if his sickness is over and then he was able to return to Philippi at this time. He was the bearer of the letter. He, he's the one that took the letter back. Uh, Philippians 4.18 says, uh, Paul says, indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Uh, the Philippians were aware that Paul needed a monetary gift, and so Epaphroditus was the one that brought it to Paul. And it's assumed, as we we're going to see, that he was sick unto death. And so when he took the journey that we uh, talked about last lesson, 800 miles, that he got sick on the way, and he almost died. And so uh, you can see there would be a real possibility for this, as we talked about in our last lesson, 800 miles walking. Uh, I don't know about you, I've never walked, I think, more than 22 miles in a day, and that was exhausting. But I can't imagine doing that day after day after day. And so because of the dangers of travel, the lack of water, food, uh, robbers, uh, bears and wolves, things that would attack uh, many travelers, it was difficult. Traveling was very difficult. And so we don't know what kind of sickness Epaphroditus got, but it was a sickness that was unto death. And so because of that, this was a setback that caused great concern for the church at Philippi. I mean, think about it. Uh, what if your pastor uh, was on a journey and he became suddenly ill? Uh, you would be concerned. If he was sick unto death, you would be concerned, right? Uh, I remember when my husband had his stroke, I think three years ago now in September, he's getting you know, it's great that he's lasted three more years. But um, I remember in this church, there were many of you look pretty scared. You're like, we're losing our pastor. He's sick unto death. He's going to die. But God had mercy, just like he did on Epaphroditus. But can you imagine the concern for the church at Philippi? Our pastor is sick. He's sick unto death. And not only were they concerned about that, but they were concerned that the money gift that they'd given to the pastor to take to Paul in prison wasn't going to get there. And so Paul's not going to have his needs met either. And so it's very possibly, possible that that is why Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And so uh, that's possibly why he deals, the subject, deals with the topic of anxiety in chapter 4, because these things could have been a temptation for the church at Philippi to be anxious. Our pastor is sick, he might die. And now, Paul's not gonna get the money that he needs in order to survive in prison. So those would be two reasons to be anxious. So it is said, in fact, it is said by the time Epaphroditus reached Rome, Paul had been in prison for a whole year. And so that's a long time. So the gift, the money was truly a blessing and the apostle wanted to express his thanks uh, which is one of the reasons he wrote the introduction in Philippians when he said, uh, I give thanks to God for you always. So Paul starts out by saying, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. What's Paul saying here? Well, evidently the Philippian believers intended for Epaphroditus to stay with Paul, uh, more than likely to stay there for a while, to take care of his needs. But Paul says, 
I'm hoping to send him back. We saw in our last lesson, he wanted to send Timothy back too. But now he says something a little bit different. He says, it's necessary that I send Epaphroditus back to you. Interesting Greek word necessary. It means it's necessary because of a spiritual or a moral reason. There's a spiritual reason or a moral reason, Paul says, that I have got to send your pastor back to you. He can't stay here and minister to my needs. He's got to get back to you. Um, and so we don't know what the necessary need was. We do know Yodi and Syndike, we're going to, when we get to chapter 4, we're going to learn about those two squabbling women that couldn't get along. And by the way, ladies, this behooves us as women to get along, right? And we don't want our names mentioned in the Word of God through all eternity, right? Uh, that would be very embarrassing. But uh, there was a spiritual need. There was a moral need. And so Paul says, I need to send him back. Uh, we don't know what all Epaphroditus told him, but he certainly told him about Yodi and Syndike, and he could have told him about some other things that were going on in the church at Philippi. And so Paul says, it's necessary that I send him back. But he lets us know six qualities of this man. First of all, he says, he's my brother. He is my brother. Uh, this indicates the type of relationship they had. He's not talking about a physical brother, but a spiritual brother. And we brought out in our last lesson about Paul and Timothy, uh, they were one soul, one-minded. Why? Because of the relationship they had in Christ. And that is the same way it is with Epaphroditus. He wasn't a physical brother, but he was a spiritual brother. And ladies, as we brought out in the last lesson, I'll bring out in this lesson, those are the best qualities of a friend, right? And many times our spiritual family is closer than our physical family. Even Jesus said that. Remember when uh, he was talking to the crowds and his mother and his brothers were standing outside and they came to him and said, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside. They want to talk to you. You remember what Jesus said? He lifted up his hands and he said to the crowd that was listening to him, behold, these are my mother's and my sisters, and my brothers. The, you know, those can wait. You guys are my mothers, and my sisters, and my brothers. Remember, his own family thought he was a demon. They thought he was crazy. And uh, so his, even Jesus' closest relationships were those that were spiritual, those that loved the Father. Now, the second feature of Epaphroditus, Paul says, he was a fellow worker. He was a fellow worker. Uh, he was a companion of Paul in the work of the Lord. Now, he's not like Timothy, Timothy helped start the church at Philippi. Epaphroditus, we don't have any history of that. But Paul still considered him a companion in the Lord. You know, I was thinking about this this morning as I was reviewing uh, all my notes. And, um, you know, I was thinking about all the women through the years that I've been able to rub shoulders with through traveling and speaking and even now discipling many pastors' wives, some in other countries. And you know what? They're my companions in the Lord. Some of them I haven't even met. We're going to get to meet one next year because she's going to be our conference speaker. But I've been discipling her for almost two years on Skype, and now we're going to, I'm going to get to meet her face-to-face. -face. And uh, I've never met her, but you know what? Face-to-face, -face, met her on Skype. But she is my companion in the Lord. So Paul and Epaphroditus didn't have the same kind of relationship that Paul and Timothy had, but... He was his companion in the Lord. Ladies, have you ever stopped to think how many brothers and sisters we have around the world that are our companions in the Lord? They may be members in your church, members of other churches around the United States or around the country. What a blessing to think that we're all co-laborers in the Lord. Do you know the body of Jesus Christ is bigger than Grace Community Church? I hate to tell you that. It's a lot bigger than Grace Community Church. Well, the third quality we find present in Epaphroditus, he's a fellow soldier, Paul says, a fellow soldier. For those of you that were in our study in 2 Timothy, uh, we saw back then we are to endure hardness as a good soldier. It's hard sometimes being a soldier. Why does he use this term here about Epaphroditus? Well, ladies, in this life, as a believer, there are a lot of battles to be fought, right? We're in a war. Uh, in fact, this last month, I'm just going to share, a, be a little bit transparent, but this last month has been probably one of the hardest in my spiritual pilgrimage in a long time. And there have been a lot of spiritual battles in my mind and things I haven't faced since, I, I don't think since my pilgrimage. Uh, but there's, it, the life of a soldier is a battle. 
There's spiritual battles. There's pressures to endure, conflicts to overcome. We're in a war, ladies. We are in a war against spiritual darkness and against the evil one. And so Epaphroditus proved himself. He was a soldier of Jesus Christ, and I hope you are too. In fact, when others think of you, do they recognize you're a soldier of Jesus Christ? Would they say you fight the good fight of fight? You, you fought, fought it good? Uh, you've done well? Do they see you fighting the battles of life and being victorious? I hope so. Epaphroditus was a good soldier. The fourth attribute of this man, he was a messenger. He was a messenger. This is someone who sent forth when a, with an official task, often indicates someone who risks his life, which indeed he did. He almost died, and so he risked his life. And ladies, notice that Paul uses the pronoun your, your. Why does he say that? Because Epaphroditus, again, was what? The pastor of the church. So Paul uses the pronoun talking back to them, your. Um, he was their messenger in the sense that he was their pastor, but also that he was bringing the gift from them to Paul in prison there. The fifth characteristic of Paul's friend Epaphroditus, Paul says this, he ministered to my needs. He ministered to my needs. Uh, again, in Philippians 4.18, when he's ending the letter, he says, I'm full. <laughs> And he's not talking about his belly being full. But he says, I'm full, having received from Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, a sweet-smelling savor. This was a precious gift to Paul uh, that was brought, the monetary gift that I'm sure provided food, uh, maybe even some clothing for him, maybe some water. Uh, you know, the, the prison uh, was very horrible, as we've talked about in previous lessons. But Epaphroditus ministered to Paul's necessities. Well, we go on to verse 26 where we note one more quality of Epaphroditus. He was longing for you all, and he was distressed because you heard that he was sick. The sixth attribute of Epaphroditus is this. He was a man marked by feelings. Paul said he longed for you, and he was also distressed. He longed for you. Remember, Paul said this to the church at Philippi. He said, I long for you. I want to see you. I know my husband, he doesn't like to be away on Sundays. And uh, the few times that we've had to be away, I, I know he identifies with Epaphroditus. I long to see you. And so we don't know how long Paul or Epaphroditus was away from the church, but he was hankering to get back there. I long to see you. So he was longing for them. But also, Paul says he was distressed. He was distressed. He was distressed because they heard, the church at Philippi heard, that he was sick. He was distressed because he didn't know how he, his sickness was affecting the church. Ladies, he was more, Epaphroditus was more concerned about the Philippians' reaction to his illness than he was his illness. That's an amazing attitude. Have you ever been around someone who's sick or maybe even dying and they're more concerned for others than they are themselves? I have. I, I've told you the story before about a lady who I was discipling who got ovarian cancer. She only lived about three weeks and I stayed in their home while she was dying. And uh, I remember as visitors would come and see her, she never talked about her illness. She never talked about herself. She would always ask, how are you? If they didn't know the Lord, she would share the gospel. And she did that the whole two, three weeks I was in their home. I never saw her concerned for herself. It was always for others. That's what Paul is saying about Epaphroditus. He's, he's not only longs for you, can't wait to see you as a pastor, but he's distressed, not because of his sickness, but he's concerned for you, how you are doing because of the fact that he's sick. He's concerned for you. Uh, I remember when Chris and Haley came, I don't know if you were here permanently yet, but it was on a Tuesday night, Doug wasn't well, and Bo called me as soon as I finished teaching that night, and he said, you better come out here, Doug's not doing well, and I remember Haley telling me, she said, Chris and I looked at all the sheep, and they're like, oh, we're losing our pastor, this was after a stroke, do you remember telling me that, and she said, 
oh my, we were just, we saw how much they love the pastor and uh, you were distressed because of his sickness. Well, Paul says Epaphroditus is more concerned about how you feel about his sickness. What a guy he was. Ladies, have you, that's the really meaning here um, in Philippians 2, 4, in a real way. Philippians 2, 4, notice what Paul says. He says, look out every man on his own things and not on the things of others. Or don't look out on your own things, but on the things of others. And that certainly was Epaphroditus. He wasn't considering himself. He was considering others. And Paul says, you've heard that he was sick. The word sick means weak, without strength, powerless, feeble. It's the same Greek word used in James 5, 4, when James says, is any one you sick, let him call for the elders of the church. The Greek word there for sick is sick unto death. In fact, in James 5, the man was dying. Um, and so this person is very sick. It's the same Greek word used in uh, John eleven four. It says, now Lazarus was sick and his sickness led to what? He died. <laughs> he died. And so Paphroditus, ladies, was sick unto death. In fact, it says that in verse 27. And so we're going to turn from the six qualities of Epaphroditus to the quick healing of Epaphroditus. Look at verse 27. For indeed he was sick. He was sick unto death, almost unto death. This literally means he was lying alongside of and near death. He was about to die. But, look at that word, but God had mercy on him. God had mercy on him. Ladies, this is a wonderful phrase here. Do you know there's times in our life when things look hopeless and helpless? But God. But God who's rich in mercy. I remember one time in our former church, we had a man who got thymus cancer and young man hadn't been married very long, no children. And uh, first of all, we don't know if he's going to live. He did live. But the doctor said, now, just to know, you'll never have children because of the chemo. Do you remember this? The chemo and things. And uh, they have three children that are grown now. But God, you know, when everything looks bleak, but God. And I recall stories like that through the years my husband's been pastoring where we've had people in our church. Situation looks hopeless, helpless, but God, right? But God. God had mercy on him. Epaphroditus was a recipient of God's mercy. In fact, the words had mercy on him are in the aorist tense, meaning this was at a moment of time that God displayed mercy. That's why it was a quick healing. God had mercy on him, and he was healed immediately. God had pity on him. God had compassion on him. In fact, it's an interesting choice of words that Paul uses here because remember Paul said that he longed after them with the tender mercies of Christ. And in fact, we're going to see that he appeals to them to have mercy as well. Well, God's mercy was not just extended to Epaphroditus, but on Paul. Notice what he says. God had mercy on him and not only on Epaphroditus, but on me. God had mercy on me. What was the reason for God's mercy on Paul? Notice what he says. Least I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Least I should have wave upon wave of sadness. Grief upon grief. Ladies, we've all had times in our life like that, haven't we? Where you just feel like, Lord, is there going to be one more thing? <laughs> I mean, one more sadness, grief upon grief, wave upon wave. And if... If God had taken Epaphroditus, Paul says it would be sorrow upon sorrow. I would lose a good friend. You all would lose the pastor of your church. <laughs> but thank, thank the Lord, God did not give Paul more than he could bear. And aren't you thankful the Lord does that in your life? I know there's been at least two times, and one has been in the last month, and another was eons ago. But I remember, you know, saying, Lord, I, I, can't, I can't take one more thing. I just can't, you know. God knows that. God who is rich in mercy. And so he didn't give Paul more than he could bear. So we move from the quick healing of Epaphroditus to the quest of the Philippian believers towards Epaphroditus as we close. What was the mission of the church? What was the quest of the church towards Epaphroditus? How were they to act towards him when he returned? Well, Paul tells them how in verse 28 to 30. He says, therefore, I send him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice. 
Paul says, I'm sending him eagerly, speedily, with haste, with diligence. I'm not going to waste any time. He's coming back immediately. Why? He gives two reasons. First of all, he says, I'm sending him back immediately for your rejoicing. You guys are sad. You need to recover your cheerfulness. Your pastor's sick. He almost died. I'm going to, I'm going to forego the needs I have here in prison. I'm going to send him back immediately. Why? So you guys will be happy again. So your joy will be recovered. Remember in Philippians 1.26, he says something about his coming to the Philippians would bring them rejoicing. But now Epaphroditus returning back to the church, the pastors would bring his sheep rejoicing. Ladies, you, hear, you understand what Paul's saying? I'm going to give him up. I'd like for him to stay. I'm going to give him up. Why? For your benefit. So that you will rejoice. You will recover your cheerfulness. In fact, it appears the Philippians were losing their joy at the thought of Epaphroditus being ill. Perhaps he wasn't going to come back. Maybe Paul isn't going to get out of prison. And so Paul says, I'm going to send him back so you guys will recover your joy. And ladies, this is a good time to pause and remind ourselves, you know, people are wonderful gifts from the Lord. They are. People are wonderful gifts from the Lord. But, and we should have an affection for one another. But keep in mind, your joy cannot be based on people. People will disappoint you, right? And they do often. And there's no guarantee that those that we love and that our closest friends are going to always be with us. They might move geographically or the Lord may take them home. In fact, I don't think it's a coincidence the middle verse of the Bible is don't put your trust in men, but put your trust where? In the Lord, right? In fact, in another psalm, it says don't put your trust in men in whom there is no help. <laughs> so even though they're wonderful gifts from the Lord, we have to remember that the Lord should be our closest companion. The second reason that Paul was eager to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi was so that he would be less sorrowful. In other words, Listen very carefully. Paul's sorrow would remain, but it would be less sorrowful by sending Epaphroditus back to them. He would be able to relieve the minds of the Philippian believers of some of the anxiety they were having. Ladies, I, I've tried to think of how Paul, how in the world this man was so selfless. I'm sending him back. I will be less sorrowful if I know you guys are happy. I want your joy to be returned. Now, questions might be coming to some of their minds at this time. Questions like, did Epaphroditus let Paul down by his illness? What kind of condition is he going to be in when he comes back to us? How should we receive this guy? How should we receive our pastor back? Well, Paul mentions three ways they are to receive Epaphroditus when he comes. This is their quest. This is their mission. Three ways. Paul says, first of all, your first responsibility when he comes back is to receive him. This means welcome him home. In fact, receive him in the Lord as you would the Lord, as you would a Christian brother. I don't know about you, but when I haven't seen friends in a while, I, I do. In fact, when we had my husband's 50th a uh, few weeks ago, and I, we had friends back way when I was 20. I was pregnant with uh, Charles. No, I wasn't pregnant yet. I can't remember. Anyway, that's what happens when you get old. But anyway, friends way back, and we were in our early 20s from Moody Bible Institute, and they came to Doug's 50th, and I saw them, and I walked in that back door, and I could hardly control myself, you know, to go and give them a hug because we were very, very young when we knew them and they came uh, to Doug's 50th thing. And so that's what Paul's saying here. Receive him in the Lord like you would a Christian brother and sister in the spirit of Christ. And there's an attitude that should accompany this welcome. Notice what he says. This is their second quest. Receive him with gladness, with joy, with open arms. Don't shun him. Don't ignore him. Give him a joyful welcome, Paul says. And the third mission they had was to hold him in high esteem, high regard, a good reputation. Honor him. Consider him as precious. He's a precious man, and you receive him as such. 
In fact, after he admonishes, after Paul admonishes the church at Philippi on how they are to receive Epaphroditus, he goes on to elaborate more on the wonderful qualities of this man in verse 30. He says, because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life, <laughs> to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Paul says, why should you receive him this way? Why do you receive him joyfully? Don't shun him. Don't ignore him. Honor him. You know, the church at Philippi could have been saying, you know, our pastor's rejected us. He's ignored us. You know, remember, there's no cell phones in those days. There's no Instagram. There's no Facebook. They have no idea what is going on. And so they're probably thinking, hey, our pastor has left us. What's going on here? And Paul says, no, you receive him joyfully and with honor. And remember, because of the work of Christ, he came close to death. And again, we don't need to re go over it again, but because of the journey, he almost died. How did he feel about that? How did Epaphroditus feel about that? Did he want to give up the ministry because it was hazardous to his health? <laughs> no. Notice what Paul says next. He didn't regard his life. The Greek word is he, he, didn't, he didn't care about his life. He gambled with his life. He risked his life. He threw it aside. He exposed himself to danger. Ladies, that's the attitude of a good soldier. We don't hold on to our life. If you save your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose it, you'll save it. That's what Jesus said. Paul says Epaphroditus didn't hold his life dearly. Ladies, we should not hold our lives dearly. We should risk them for the sake of the gospel. Well, Paul goes on to say, as he ends in verse 30, he says, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. What's he saying here? Paul says, Epaphroditus supplied or filled up what was lacking in what Paul needed. The Philippian believers had only started in their service and ministry to Paul. And Paul says, Epaphroditus risked his life to fill up the cup of service that they could not fill. You can't be with me here in prison, Paul says. So Epaphroditus is what? He's filling up what is deficient in your ministering to me because you can't be here to minister to me. So Epaphroditus has. So Paul says, because he risked his life for the Lord and for me, and so because of this, then when he comes home, you welcome him with gladness and with honor. So what are the qualities of Epaphroditus? Six to be exact. He's a brother. He's a fellow. He's a worker. He's a fellow soldier. He's a messenger. He ministered to Paul's needs, and he's a man marked by feelings. The quick healing of Epaphroditus, this dear man almost died, but by God's mercy, his life was extended. He was healed immediately. The quest of the Philippian believers towards Epaphroditus, what are they to do? They're to give him a warm welcome. They're to receive him with joy and hold him in high honor. So, ladies, let me ask you in closing. Do you feel like a hidden saint? Do you feel like you never give any th get any thanks for what you do? If that's the case, let me encourage you by, first of all, calling to remembrance that we serve the Lord Christ, really, regardless of what is seen by others. We serve the Lord. And secondly, let me call to remembrance 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 29, where Paul writes this, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things that are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Ladies, it really doesn't matter if we're known, unknown. What matters is that we serve the Lord Christ, even if we don't get any recognition. In fact, we shouldn't be doing it for that, right? That's what false teachers do. You don't do things to get recognized. You don't do things to get appreciated or noticed. Now, Epaphroditus isn't probably someone on your can't wait to get talked to in heaven list. I have those that I can't wait to talk to in heaven. I can't say that Epaphroditus is one of those, but you know what? I think Epaphroditus will have just as many rewards as Timothy in heaven because of his faithful, humble service to the Lord and to the church at Philippi. 
Ladies, without the Timothys and the Epaphroditus, there might not have been the Apostle Paul. These two men were willing to promote and advance the success of Paul. They lived out Philippians 2.4. They didn't look out for their own interest. They looked out for the interest of Paul. They scoped out his needs, and they tried to meet those needs, even to the point of almost dying on his behalf. Who are the Timothys, and who are the Epaphroditus in your life? Who are the ones that serve you? Have you thanked them lately? Or maybe you are a Timothy or you are an Epaphroditus in someone else's life. If so, do you serve them joyfully? Regardless of who you are and what you do, let us do everything with selfless motives to advance God's kingdom and to advance the success of others, right? Therein lies true joy. Let's pray. Father, what a great God you are that you have created man in your own image, in your own likeness, that we might glorify you. We know that is the, the chief desire of man, is to glorify you forever, enjoy you. We thank you for the body of Christ, for the many hands and the many feet that do your work. We pray that we would uh, be mindful to uh, give special appreciation maybe to those that are behind the scenes, like Epaphroditus, those that we don't see much or hear much about, but they're laboring to the point of exhaustion behind the scenes. And so, Lord, help us to be thankful for them and, and hold them in high regard and, and treat them as we would uh, those that are maybe in the forefront lines of the battle or those that are serving in the role of pastor or teacher, Lord. May we realize that we all work together for one purpose, and that is to glorify and honor you. Thank you again for this time together. We pray that you would bless in our week. May we be using it to scope out the needs of others and not the needs of ourselves. We thank you for your word and the joy it is to study it. In Christ's name, amen. Mm -hmm.